listening to Law and Gospel on this June the 29th in the year of our Lord 2020. I'm Pastor Tom Baker, and as is our custom, we're taking a look at a reading for the following Sunday, which is the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. And being on July the 5th, it's the day after Independence Day. So, we could look at Zechariah 9, Romans 7, or Matthew 11. We're going to be taking a look at what I consider to be a very important passage from Romans chapter 7. It concludes with the idea, are we a sinner or are we a saint? And we're going to end up finding out that we are both. Well, what percentage? We're 100% a sinner and 100% a saint. How is that possible? Only Christianity teaches that. So without further ado, Romans seven fourteen to 25a. 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh and sold under sin. Now, what we're talking about here is what the previous passage was talking about, that a proper understanding of the law is a spiritual understanding. It's part of the holy Christian church. Because as a Christian in the holy Christian church, you are able to do what's called fruit of the Holy Spirit in agreement with the spiritual law of Jesus Christ. But we are also of the flesh, which means sin still has sway over us. This is the Apostle Paul after he was converted. Verse 15, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. What's he talking about? What does he want to do? Spiritually, because of the Holy Spirit, he wants to follow the will of God. But it's very difficult for him to do that because he is a sinner. And so while he might not often do actions that are sinful, thoughts and words often come out that are not appropriate. We, we learn that from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Remember the first commandment, you've heard it said that thou shalt not kill, but I tell you that even if you have a bad thought or a bad word against someone that is inappropriate, that is sinful, you deserve eternal damnation. So, he says, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want... I agree with the law that it is good. Now, whoa, whoa. Does that make any sense? If when you hear the law, you don't do what the law says, then how can you agree that the law is good? Because what Paul is showing is that the purpose of the law for the flesh is to show that we are sold under sin, that we oftentimes cannot help ourselves in doing what God wants us to do. But we therefore hear from the law that we are sinning. Now, he makes it very clear in the previous verses that the problem is not the law. The problem is sin, and he repeats that in verse 17. So now, 
It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Now, here the Apostle Paul, when he refers to the I who do it, he's referring to his Christian maturity. He is referring to the spirituality of the law. He really wants to obey the law of God. What Christian doesn't want to obey the law of God? A lot of times, Christians are misled as to what is the law of God. Like in our day, look how many people are living immoral lives because they're told by so-called preachers that it doesn't matter how you live as long as you're sincere and as long as you're following what the Holy Spirit is telling you. Well, that's wrong because the Holy Spirit speaks to you through Scripture. That is the means of grace. And the law, therefore, is the means of telling you what is God's will. We often refer to that as the third use of the law. The first being, well, the government use to curb wickedness. They have punishments. The second use, of course, is the church's use to show someone they're a sinner by preaching the full law. Not partway, but fully. Not just, oh, here's what you're doing wrong, but also here's what you're thinking and saying wrong. And then the third use of the law is for Christians when they want to know what is God's will for me today? What is it that I should be doing? And one takes a look at Scripture. I rarely preach the third use of the law in sermons because what Christian doesn't already have become aware of through confirmation that thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not break marriage vows, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not covet, etc. As Paul says earlier in the text, if I hadn't heard the command, thou shalt not covet, I wouldn't have desired to covet so much. And the reason for that is because I am of the flesh, still sold under sin. And any time somebody tells me what I am to do, I desire to do the opposite. Because I'm of the flesh. I have a sinful nature. But is it the law that ought to be held responsible because of my disobedience to it? No, I agree with the law that it is good because it is like a mirror to show me what I'm really like before Almighty God. And therefore, the law drives me to Christ. He says in verse 17, Now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. This is very important for Christians to understand. It's why we begin a lot of our liturgies with a confession of sin. We do not believe that a Christian is a person who has stopped from sinning. We believe that a Christian is a person who is now more aware of sin within them. And therefore, they can confess and repent of it and then hear the words of absolution. Upon this, your confession, the pastor says, I, by virtue of my office, and that's the office of being the word of Christ, announce to you the forgiveness of sins. Paul continues in verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me now what's he talking about he just said that his I and that's capital I 
that it is good from the law because it's no longer I who do it, that sin that dwells within me. So what does he talk about that nothing good dwells in me? He explains it in verse 18. That is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Now, it's not that a Christian is unable to keep from sinning. There's a lot of sins that Christians do not do. I mentioned that I'm not going to repent of any racism I have any more than I would repent of robbing the Bank of America. And the reason I won't repent of either one is because I have not robbed the Bank of America and I do not believe that I have racist views. Racist views, as I understand it, is you look down on a person because of maybe the color of their skin, maybe from where they have come, uh, maybe the people they hang around. No. I don't have that problem. In fact, I really enjoy driving around for Uber because I pick up all kinds of people that most individuals would not appreciate. It's not at all unusual that I would pick up, say, three young girls from a bar at 1 a.m. in St. Louis, and I listen to their conversation, and it's one swear word after another. Now, do I hate these women because of that? No. Do I hate what they're saying and they're thinking, yes. But it's been really interesting how many times I'll drop two of them off at their home, and I'm taking the last one to her home, and we get into a conversation about what I believe. And a lot of times I've had to stop the car when we get her home, and she sits in the car continuing to listen and converse with me, in regard to the Lutheran understanding of proper speech and also faith in Jesus Christ. So I look at this as opportunities. I I do not hate these people because there but for the grace of God go I. It's not that I don't sin in many areas. No, that does happen. And I can't help myself. As Paul says in verse 19, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. That's the Apostle Paul after he has been converted. That's me, Pastor Tom Baker, after I have become a pastor. But then verse 20 is really important. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Yeah, one of the problems I have, because at times we put on a 1,000 miles per week, sometimes you get involved in a, a traffic jam, and you're going to be late in getting to KFUO or the congregation I'm preaching at. And so I have a tendency to kind of go over the speed limit. And even when I'm doing it, I'm remembering it's not what I really want to do. But you get the idea that God will excuse that because you'll be getting to your place on time. But no. It is sin that dwells within me. So verse 21, Paul uses the word law in a kind of a different way. So I find it to be a law, and and there you would use the word like principle. This is the way life works. 
that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. I mean, how many times have we disobeyed our parents? They tell us to do one thing or another thing, clean our room, take out the garbage, etc., etc. And we use every excuse why we're unable to do that because we just don't like anybody telling us what we have to do. In fact, a lot of divorces end up that way because in a proper marriage, the individuals need to be humble and therefore live a life that really is not easy to do because of evil lying close at hand. Paul finally starts making the distinction. You've often heard about the old man and the new man. The old man is our flesh self, our sinful self. The new man is our spiritual self under the Holy Spirit. He talks about that in verse 22. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Now, what does he mean by that? The inner being is that which is within him. And what is that which is within him? Namely, the Holy Spirit that he received at baptism. So he delights in the law of God in my inner being. Yeah, Christians... They delight that they don't steal. They delight that they don't kill. But, verse 23, I see in my members another law, another principle, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So how do we explain this? Well, we have an old Adam that loves to rebel against the law. And we have a new man that has learned from the Holy Spirit not to rebel. The more we hear how much Jesus has done for us, the more we realize how much we want to do for Jesus. We don't do good works in order to get to heaven. No, no good work can get us to heaven. We do good works as a response to the fact that we are going to heaven. And therefore, that's why the gospel, which is the good news of what Jesus Christ has done for us, is so important. The law needs to be heard in its fullness. We ought not back off the law and give a person a feeling that, no, even though there are some areas of life for which there is no need of repentance, those areas are still not sufficient enough to merit your way to heaven. Because you have another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Why do a lot of people not like going to work? Because when they get to work, they come under a new set of laws as to how they're to operate within the office. I saw that when I worked at Chrysler. I was on the assembly line And they had individuals who often would watch us, foremen they were called, to make sure that we were using the right amount of pressure when we put bolts in the trucks, etc. But I often saw guys kind of taking it easy when the foreman wasn't around. But when the foreman was there, boy, they worked real hard. And it looked like that they were the best of workers. That, that's kind of like having a job that you look forward to going to. Boy, that's a, a real gift from God. And 
a lot of people have that. I, I know I sure do. As a pastor, I enjoy going to the four congregations that I'm serving right now, uh, and we're getting back now. In fact, we've already done one this past week, and this Sunday we start the others. So within a week and a half, we'll have gone to all four congregations, although one of them is, of course, a university that hasn't reopened. But some of the students on campus will come over to the church to hear the message of Jesus Christ. So after Paul says, boy, I've got a war going on in me. The law of my mind is being made captive to the law of sin. So what does he say in verse 24? Wretched man that I am. And then comes the big question. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Why does he call it a body of death? I mean, aren't we all going to die? But the death that he's talking about is the death that Jesus Christ talked about to Adam and Eve. In the day that you sin, death will be the result. That death is eternal damnation, separation from God. And did that not happen? Adam and Eve sinned, and they immediately tried to become separate from God. How? By hiding in bushes where God already was, because he's omnipresent. So Paul has a real question. I've got this old Adam in me. i got this new man in me. They're at constant war. I'm always falling into sin. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And then verse 25a. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the only verse that's talking about Jesus. But it's a verse that you could expand into three hours. Why do we thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord? Because Jesus has done something for us, for believers, that we were unable to do for ourselves. He took upon himself our sin. As 2 Corinthians 5 says, He became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. See, this is what's so different about Christianity in comparison to every other religion in the world. Every other religion, you need to become righteous. But that righteousness comes about by your works. Are you behaving properly? Are you following the will of God? That's really what saves you in every other religion in the world. But Romans 7 that we've just read shows that none of us can reach that pinnacle of good works to merit our way into salvation. Because no matter how hard we love the will of God, we've got that other law waging war against the law of our mind, making us captive to the law of sin. That's why on this particular Sunday, which is the day after the wonderful making of America free, we can talk about that in the United States, we have a freedom. And to me, the most important one is the freedom of speech, that we're able to say whatever we want, particularly from the Bible, and not have to worry about being arrested. That's tremendous. That's not true in other countries. But the most important thing to get across 
is the freedom that we have because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. On tomorrow's Law and Gospel with Mark Smith, we're going to be taking a look at a hymn, and the name of the hymn is, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. What did that voice say? Tune in tomorrow to hear it. I'm Tom Baker. God bless. Listen to Law & Gospel each weekday morning at 9.30 on KFUO. For a tax-deductible gift to Law & Gospel, please make your check payable to Concordia Mission Society and mail it to Tom Baker, P.O. Box 28910, St. Louis, Missouri, 63132. To give online, visit lawandgospel101.com or call toll-free 1-877-267-1962. Views and opinions expressed on Worldwide KFUO may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you'd like to comment on programs or topics heard on Worldwide KFUO, write us at KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. You can also leave a question or comment on our comment line at 314-996-1542. We are the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO.